Hey you folks, Quilly King here, and welcome to a tutorial for Crusader Kings 2 for complete beginners! It is time, it is long past time for us to do a refreshed tutorial for CK2, and it is the perfect time for it, because this game is now free! You can go on your favorite platform, I don't know, Paradox Plaza, Steam, wherever, and get the base game of Crusader Kings 2 for free! And I thought, well, that might be bringing a bunch of people into the game, plus the announcement that Crusader Kings 3 is coming out next year. Let's go ahead and do this tutorial. Um, I do have a lot of videos for this on my channel, lots of Let's Plays, and we do generally try to uh, explain what we're doing and why we're doing when you do a Let's Play. And so if you've got the basics of the game already down, that might be the best place to learn it. But if you don't, hopefully this will be the place for you. Let's go ahead and dive right in. We've got a lot of things that can be covered. We're going to try to go through them quickly, but without, um, but w w with, you know, hopefully again, fairly beginner friendly. I am playing this with all the expansions turned off. So there's a lot of extra content, because I mean, at this point, Crusader Kings 2 is what, eight years old? There have been so many patches. If in, even if you did a tutorial for this at release, um, the game looks almost nothing the same as release. Uh, so many things have changed. Lots of expansions have come out. There's, some of the expansions are must have for everyone. Some of them are more um, situational, like for example, Sword of Islam, you'll want it if you want to be able to play as a Muslim leader, but if you don't care about that, you don't need to pick that up right away. I will try to have some information down in the description box as to which expansions you might want to prioritize if you decide you want to get started. But the fact of the matter is, the vanilla game, the base game here, very playable, very fun. So feel free to just play with it first, see if you're into it, and then consider getting some of the expansions. So we're going to start off by going to single player over here. Then, uh, new game, and on this screen here, we're going to get to choose when you want to start playing. So the end game for Crusader Kings 2 is 1453, because that really marks a transition from the idea that the realms, you know, sort of the countries, the nations in the world, but not really, the realms in CK2 are these feudal monarchies that are really just the land, you know, some king happened to kind of rule over, as opposed to more cohesive nation states bound by common cultures, um, which is really the transition to, say, the European or Salus period. There's changes in technology and transportation. Um, EU4 does the whole world map, whereas Crusader Kings is more focused on, well, just yeah, Europe plus. I mean, there's quite a lot of territory. But anyway, it's there. But you also get to choose when to start. Now, the, the classic Crusader King start is the High Middle Ages, 1066. Uh, which is right after William the Conqueror has, in fact, conquered England, and really sets the the tone for for what England is going to look like for well in, in the next thousand years. Um, you know, it, it's probably the single most significant event um, to happen to that chunk of land, possibly. I don't know. I'm not a historian, but it feels like maybe. Um, so if you do click on a starting period, right, if you click on High Middle Ages, what's going to happen here is the game is going to show you some rulers that might be interesting to play as. Now, these rulers are, like, they're really cool, there's a lot of stuff going on, but they, a lot of them control a fairly significant portion of land. William the Conqueror, all of England, some bits of northern France, Heinrich IV is the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, so basically kind of Germany and things like that. These are some big dudes, a lot of stuff going on, it may not actually be the best pick for your starting. Now, are you limited? to just these three little time bookmarks, the Iron Century, which came out for free as part of the last patch, the High Middle Ages 1066, or the Late Middle Ages, the Elite year Era over here, or if you have the expansions, these others over here. No, you're not limited to that. There's actually a lot more flexibility. And likewise, you're not just limited to these seven rulers. What we're going to do here is we're actually going to click the Custom Gain Setup uh, button. And that's going to give us access to the whole world. To move around the map, I, I like to click the middle mouse button and drag. You can also just push against the, uh, the sides of the map over here. And you can also use the arrow keys if that's your jazz. Now, here is the playable world in Crusader Kings 2. Uh, since release, more territory has been added. Um, I don't know where the old borders used to be. I feel like it was like shump, shump, something like that, maybe. Um, so, you know, India, some more of these, the, the, just the, 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 the tip of Asia, I guess you could say over here, and more of Africa. Uh, those are all added post-release, adding a lot more content to the game. Now, not every ruler is playable if you don't have the expansion. So again, if you want to play as a Muslim ruler, if you want to play as a merchant republic, if you want to play someone in India, there are expansions required for that. But 
If you want to play as a Christian ruler, which, you know, this is Crusader King, so it kind of makes sense. Uh, there's a lot of that. Oh, there's also pagan people over here that um, you can play if you have the Old Gods or Holy Fury content. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of that. But yeah, you can focus. And the thing is, even if you don't have the content, those characters do exist in your game and can be interacted with. You just can't play them as a ruler. Um, but yeah, there's still a lot left to do, even if you don't have that stuff. Now, at the top of the screen, we've got different map modes we can cycle through. Them. By default, it's on terrain map mode, so you know, it looks... By the way, you can scroll in with the, uh, the mouse wheel. Um, you know, it's pretty, it's got some trees, sure, that's fine, but is it that useful? Perhaps not. I really like to spend most of the time in the realms view. So this will highlight independent realms. Um, so France is ruled by a king. Holy Roman Empire is ruled by, well, an emperor, I suppose. England's got a king, Scotland's got a king, so on. So these are independent realms um, that don't bend the knee to each other, basically. Um, and this is a pretty useful map mode. Now, we're going to look a lot more at the world and what it looks like, but we're going to start by jumping into the game. Now, over on the left-hand side here, we've got other bookmarks for starting dates. You can also just choose a date by clicking through these things, which is kind of interesting. We are going to start in the Iron Century bookmark over here. So the 7th of August... 936 is when we're going to start. So you can see the world looks a little bit different here from the 1066 start. Uh, we've got West Francia instead of France. England is still here, but this is England before the Norman Conquest. So it's very different culturally um, and everything like that. Um, there's more more pagan religions going on. If you actually go to the religious map mode over here, uh, so you know, Catholic, Catholic, Slavic, Romuva, Germanic, uh, so we've got some Norse, we've got some different things like that. Lots, I mean, there's tons of religions all over the place um, to play as. And they all play fairly different. But we are going to play in Ireland. Ireland has, since the start of CK2, been considered sort of newbie island. It's a great place to start because, you know, you're a little off on your own. You know, a little bit more isolated from the world. You don't have to deal with as many people. Um, your realm is going to be a little bit smaller, so easier to manage. And your neighbors are small, which means, you know, you're on a similar power base or possibly in a better place to take over. And we're going to specifically play in Mumu over here. The independent petty kingdom of Mumu, which is probably not how it's pronounced. Um, just be ready for everything to be mispronounced. Just assume every single word I say is wrong and uh, things will be better. So we're going to play over there. Now, if we click anywhere in here, what's going to happen is it's going to select King Flathbertok. King Fred. King Fred. Fred over here. Good old Fred is the king of Mumu. Now, if you click a second time in some of these provinces, it will actually select someone different. So here we've got Chief uh, Senatig of Tadkur... Hu... Hu... Of this place over here. Let's see. Some areas have easier to pronounce words than others. Ireland can be a little bit rough, but uh, we'll, we'll make do over here. Um, so just be aware that as you click, what you're selecting, this is who you're going to be playing as. You're not playing as the nation. The idea of a nation of a country didn't really exist then. You're choosing which ruler to play as. You can play as either the king of Mumu, or you can play as one of his subordinates, one of the chief. This chief is the chief of only this county over here. And he bends the knee to King Fred. So we're going to pick, we're going to play as King Fred over here for the purpose of this. I'm going to hit play. We're going to get an, op, an ability to choose our game rules. Now this can be very intimidating. This, you can scroll here. There's a lot to choose. Over the course of the development of CK2, various expansion come out, lots of new features have been introduced. And right from the start as well, there's some people want to play a game that's more historical and realistic. And some people want to play a game that's a little bit more alt history in certain ways um and then there's also just some pure mechanical rules like shattered retreat what happens when an army loses a battle how do they run away from the site some people for shattered retreat some people what does this mean you don't have to worry about it there's a button over here that will reset the rules so if i do that we're on the default there's some things you can do and you can scroll up and down this whole list you can also go down this little filter here to be able to choose um specific subcategories to look at instead of the entire list at the same time. But for example, uh, supernatural events over here. Do you want the supernatural events on or off? So do you want like like actual, you know, things with, with spirits or godly intervention or, or, or demons or Cthulhu or something showing up? Do you want that to be part of your game? Yes, no. Um, so you can choose whether that's enabled. Gender equality. Do you want it to be sort of default and historical, which may, mostly means 
bad, or do you want to go and have full gender equality so that you know women can inherit and rule and take office and things like that right from the start? There are on the default setting over here. There are some um, some places where they can do that actually in different laws and things like that. <laughs> Absurd events on and off. So there's lots of ways to tune this. We're just going to leave the default on over here. The other button that you might be interested in here is enabling Iron Man mode. So Iron Man mode is the only way that you can earn achievements. And what Iron Man mode is, you can't manually save the game. The game automatically saves constantly um, and only in one save slot. So you can't go back. If you make a mistake, you can't go back to an earlier save to try to do something differently. So obviously that makes the game a little bit more challenging, but it can be a lot of fun. And yeah, that gives you um, achievements. I'm going to leave this off for the purpose of my tutorial here. I'm going to go ahead and just hit start game. What we're going to do when the game loads, we are going to get another pop-up here, which is going to tell us about who we are in the world and what that means. Um, basically, depending on your culture, and especially depending on your religion, the game is going to be fairly different. So we get a bit of a description about Crusader Kings 2. Yeah, we don't hold, we can't hold infinite amounts of land ourselves. It's the feudal system. We have to delegate. Right? We're going to be king, and beneath us are going to be dukes, and beneath them are going to be counts, and beneath them are going to be barons. You've got this whole sort of, I don't know, pyramid scheme going on, basically, to rule your land. If I hit next over here, so we're going to be playing as an Irish Catholic king. So, um, because we're Irish, we have access to various things. Um, right now, we're sort of tribal, so there are certain rules that are going to happen over there. We are Catholic, so there's certain rules that are going to happen there as well. So depending on who you're playing, your combination of technology, culture, and religion is going to have pretty significant impacts on the things you can do and how they work. Don't worry about this for now, though. We're just going to go ahead and close this. Also, if this is your first time playing, tutorials... Um, there is a tutorial in the game, but we're not doing that. There's, but in addition to that, when you play the game, there's sort of like tutorially hint pop-ups that will come up, especially as you open screens for the first time. Uh, I've got those disabled, but they are worth reading uh, for your first playthrough over here. All right, so here's the map. Same sort of thing as we were looking at before. And again, we can still pan around, zoom in and out. And again, if you want to change the map mode from the default terrain one to maybe the realms mode, which you might find more handy. That's what you do down at the bottom right. So the bottom right, we've got a mini map, which you can use to sort of poke around the world if you want. And then there's also map modes over here. You might have to shrink and expand this bit here to see what the, they all are. Uh, and we'll look at more of these um, as we go forward, but I'm just gonna switch to the realms button over here so we can see these individual realms and see what the heck is going on. And yeah, again, we're over here in Mumu. Now, Again, and this is a, it's a tricky concept for people the first time they play. You are not playing as a nation. You are playing as a person, and specifically, you are playing as a dynasty. You're playing as a family. That's really, truly what you're playing as. Because right now, we're playing as King Fred over here. But King Fred's 65, and it's the year 936. King Fred probably doesn't have long left in this world. At some point, he's going to kick the bucket, and we're going to take over as his heir, which in this case is going to be our son, uh... Kusen or Susen. I'm gonna go with hard C's, I think, for Irish over here. Ku, Ku Ken, I guess, over here. It's Ken! Hey! We'll have to find him a wife called Barbie. So we got our son Ken is gonna be our heir. Now, our heir is not always going to be our son. There may be vastly different ways that inheritance can happen. In this case, it is gonna be our son that we are gonna play as when King Fred dies. This is a perfectly fine and normal fact of Crusader Kings. Over the hundreds of years of gameplay that you're going to play, you're going to play as a variety of different characters over time. And you might also play as a variety of different realms. There is many different reasons why we may not always be the king of Mumu. For, we might lose our title. We might just become a chief of a little province. Still maybe within Mumu, who knows? Or maybe, um, maybe the owners of provinces will change a little bit because of conquest or various things or, or weird succession laws that can happen. Um, we might also be able to form different nations. If we go and expand our realm some more, uh, we might be able to declare ourselves the king of Ireland as opposed to just the king of Mumu. Let's talk about the geography of the world over here. If we zoom in and we click on any one of these counties, or I might say provinces sometimes, just because in other Paradox games they're referred to that, right? If we take a look at uh, Desmuhan over here, which I believe um, is, is province of Desmond now, or the county of Desmond. If we click on Desmond over here, we're going to get a pop-up which is telling us about this county itself, Desmond. Now, inside of Desmond are a variety of what, what the game here calls holdings. They, you can think of them as, as cities and 
and castles and different things like that that exist, or baronies. These are smaller subdivisions. So there's the county level, which is on the map, and there's smaller subdivisions of this, which isn't represented on the map, but is instead in this pop-up. So here we have the, the Desmond tribe listed, and we've also got a bishopric of clone. So this bishopric is a, it's a church that's in our realm. And this is being run by someone else, not by us. Um, if I click on this little shield here, I can find out that it's this guy, Bishop Laguerre of Clone is the person running that bishopric. And he, he bends the knee to me. He bends to me, the knee to me. And you have to remember, this is a giant pyramid scheme. So you've got these sort of barren level dudes who bend the knee to the person who runs the county who bends the knee to the person who runs the duchy, who bends the knee to the person who runs the kingdom, who potentially bends the knee to the person who runs the empire, which could be a whole other level above that. Now, we, if I click on us, so this is us in the top left corner, King Fred, if we click on us, we can see what our titles are over here. Our lowest title that we've got is the chiefdom of Desmond. We are the chief of this county. We run this county directly. Okay, Desmond is ours, this is where we live, and we are directly responsible for building things and maintaining it and all that kind of stuff. We also get the taxes from it directly. In addition to that, we also have the title, it says Petty Kingdom of Mumu. What this is, this is a duchy level title. So basically, we are, we are sort of a duke, right? Next in this level, oh, we've got baron, then count, then duke. In Irish culture, instead of being called Count, it's called the Chiefdom. Uh, I think in Scottish culture, instead of being called Count, it's called an Earl, but it's a Count level title. So we are the Count of Desmond or the Chief of Desmond. Um, above that, we have a Duke level title. Now, because there's no king above us, because we're an independent duchy, it's the game calls it a petty kingdom over here. So we can call ourselves king, well, we're not much of a king because it's not much territory. We would like to become a proper king. We'd like to become a king of Ireland as a whole later on, at which point this will be referred to as like the duchy, basically, of, of Mumu. So the duchy of Mumu with the county of Desmond. Now there's three other counties in here in the kingdom of Mumu, but we don't rule those directly. What's the deal? Well, if we click on one of them, so if we look at Laka Lane over here, so Laka Lane is run specifically by this guy, Chief Brandub. Chief Brandub rules, he's the chief of this county. He rules it directly, but he bends the knee to me. If I mouse over his portrait here, it says he's my vassal. And over here, his liege, this is the person he bends the knee to, is me. I'm the boss of him. Now, he's the boss of these people. He's basically a middle manager. Now, he collects the taxes from this directly. Theoretically, you know, he's going to kick some stuff up to me. He's got troops in this territory. If I go to war, he's got to give me some of his troops to go to war with. So, you know, he's he's forced to do that. In return, in theory, I am protecting him from, you know, other enemies outside the realm. That kind of jazz. I want to keep him happy. I would like to keep all my vassals happy. I, in fact, have three vassals. If I go and click on myself over here, right? This is me. Actually, I've got four vassals. Right. That makes sense. And you see, I've got tabs here. First of all, there's the, the family tab. We'll look at that soon. If I look at my vassals tab, I can see I have four vassals. I have three chiefs, the chief of here, here, and here. And then I also have this bishop, right? The bishop in the bishopric over here. These are all the people that bend the knee to me. Now, they have an opinion of me, and they also are supposed to potentially pay some taxes to me. Turns out, because we are tribal over here, we don't get that kind of mechanic. We are not a proper organized feudal monarchy, so these guys don't kick taxes up to me. The bishop, though, should. He actually earns um, 7.6 uh, gold per month? No, per year. Oh, wait. He earns 21 ducats, 21 gold pieces per year in taxes, and he's kicking 35% of that up to me, which is great. He might not always do that, though. He likes me, a 77. He likes the Pope, a 38. If he likes the Pope more than he likes me, he'll actually send this money to Rome instead. So we really want to keep um, Legaire over here um, in my good graces because I want those tax dollars so that I can spend money and do cool things with it. Build cool castles or just fund powerful armies so that I can go and expand, expand, expand burr, my realm. Okay. This concept can be tricky. I've focused on it because it can be tricky for people to sort of grok it and really kind of download this kind of structure in their brain. 
what else are we going to look at? Let's look at the top right corner real quick here. Here we have our wealth. This is how much money we have to be able to spend to, to build or to maintain armies and so on and so forth. Um, we are currently earning 0.88 ducats per month. And yeah, we have 61 ducats currently in the bank. We then have prestige and piety. These two things will accumulate naturally over time. Um, prestige, we're very fancy. And piety, you know, we, we believe in God and we, you know, prayed him and whatnot. And so the more prestigious and the more pious we are, the more some people will like us. The more prestigious we are, everyone will like us a little bit more. And the more pious we are, the more the church type people will like us, which is great. There's also some variety of events and things like that that might allow you to spend prestige or piety to do stuff. So in a sense, these are sort of currencies, but they also passively do something. Next over here, we've got our domain size. Not Demesne, it, it is pronounced more like Domain or Domain. Uh, this is how much territory we directly control. And right now we directly control one, one county. And that's true, the county of Desmond is the only one we directly control. We could control, um, here it says one of five, in the tooltip it says one of six. Most likely it's because um, one of the numbers just changed internally when we loaded the game and the five here hasn't updated. If I were to unpause, this would probably change to a six basically right away. So the tooltip is um, is most likely the most up-to-date over here. We can control up to six territory directly. And that's mostly as a result of our stewardship skill. The better our stewardship skill, the more land we can control directly. If we go above this limit, then we just become very ineffectual at managing all of our territory, and we're gonna get less tax dollars and things like that. So generally speaking, if you go above your domain size, what you wanna do is you want to assign some of these counties to a count to take care of, or a local chief. He'll take care of it, um, but he'll still bend the knee to you, and that tends to be the structure that you end up with. We've also got a limit, a, a vassal limit over here. This is how many people we can have directly bend the knee to us. This does not, this limit doesn't come up as often. The domain limit, yes, this one not so much. And over here, we've got a realm size, just generally speaking, how big we are, how impressive we are. It doesn't really do anything directly. And over here, we got a score. Basically, every time we die, um, the prestige and piety that we've accumulated gets added to a score for our dynasty. It doesn't do anything on its own, but or it doesn't do anything at all, really, but it feels cool, and uh, therefore, that's awesome. We'll have important messages showing up over here. We've also got an outliner over here. I often play with this locked and kept open, so this lets me track all the territory in my domain. Um as well as what my council is doing, but I think I'll just unlock this for now so it can stay hidden at this time. All right. There are over here some pop-ups and really this is the biggest part of playing the game. Actually, hold on, before I get here, I wanna talk about the time. Crusader Kings 2 is a real time game in a sense. If I unpause the game, time will flow. We're the 7th of August, now we're the 8th of August, see the number updated to one of six, as I said, the 9th of August and so on. It's hidden the space bar, lets you pause and unpause. You can also just click on this area to pause and unpause. Time controls are over here, make things go faster, make things go slower. You can also use the plus and minus on your keyboard to do that. Do keep in mind, if you're using the, the, the plus sign sort of in your number row as opposed to your numpad, that plus sign is probably actually equal. You probably have to hit shift equal to do plus to change the time that way. So you can go from speed one to speed five. Um, most of the time, you're probably playing on like speed three, four, or maybe even five if you're waiting for something, and just pause. And that's usually the way you do it. Play at a fairly high speed and just pause by hitting the space bar whenever something important happens. Or maybe you'll play it at speed two or something like that and just take it easy. Speed one's pretty slow. Most people, I don't think, play on that. Um, so those are the time controls. Now, over here, we've got pop-ups. This is one of the most important things for you to keep an eye on in the game because this lets you know when stuff, when there's stuff going on that you probably want to deal with. For example, we got a pop up here. Hey, our heir, Ken there, Ku Ken, he's not married. We should probably get him married. That's an excellent idea, game. So if I click on this, it'll bring up my heir. Here he is, Ku Ken Mac Flathbertak. So the son of Fred is what's going on here. By the way, here's our, our house. This is our um, dynasty. We are house Meskreg? McCraig? Eh, McCraig maybe, I don't know. House McCraig is us. This is our dynasty, and this is who we're, we're playing as. If at any point our heir is not of our dynasty and we die, that's game over. So you always want to make sure that you're you're you know you're you're spreading your dynasty and that you make sure that your 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 heirs are going to inherit stuff along the way. Now you might not always inherit anything. It's possible that the kingdom is going to be inherited by some other dude in some other dynasty. But you know as long as you keep something, as long as you say you inherit your county, then you can keep playing. 
Um, and don't worry about... There's no winning the game, but wait. There's no victory condition for Crusader Kings. There's no way to win. It's just your personal goals. Maybe your personal goal is to have the Empire of Ireland spread all the way to India and just be this giant green blob. Hey, that's a valid way of playing. But honestly, with Crusader Kings, mostly it's about having fun as your character and your dynasty does stuff. Um, and just ex enjoy the the fun of the playing as opposed to trying to paint the map because painting the map's not the real joy and magic of Crusader Kings. Anyway. So, yes, we have this unmarried heir. Let's do something about that. So then I can click on my face over here to bring up my character sheet. There's my heir over there. I can click on this or anyone's. I can check out my wife. Hey, there's my wife. Go back to me. Hey, there we go. I can check out my family. I've got three children. I've got the one with the crown. He's my heir. But I've got another son. I've got uh, I am Chad over here. And I've got a daughter, Lurbin. So I can click on any of those. I can check out Chad, see how he's doing. But yeah, let's, uh, let's check out our heir. So this is my heir. Now, every character in Crusader Kings has a variety of stats. They've got Diplomacy, Martial, Stewardship, Intrigue, and Learning over here. The characters themselves have a stat, and in addition to that, your advisors, your spouse, your various things like that could give you a boost to those statistics. For example, if we look at ourselves over here, um, my personal diplomacy skill, diplomacy skill is 11, but my state diplomacy is 29. 11 for me, plus seven for my spouse. My wife is helping us out with diplomacy and my counselors are giving me another plus 11 over there for a total of 29. So surrounding yourself with good people is really helpful. Um, these numbers get modified by things. You can see I have a base diplomacy of nine, but I have plus three because I'm charitable and minus one because I'm envious. These are the traits over here, character traits. Each character has a huge pool of traits that they could have. Each character will have some sort of education trait, first of all. So I'm a skilled tactician. Everyone's gonna have something here for the education. So my wife is a gray eminence and my heir is an elusive shadow, woo. In addition to that, my heir is chaste, which gives him more piety and more of a learning boost, but lowers his fertility because he's not into bumping uglies all that much. He is envious, which is good for his intrigue, but hurts his diplomacy and he's temperate which gives them the boost to stewardship. Also, the church approves of this. Um, and yeah, people with the same trait, like you, and people with the opposite trait, so Roth, I think, in this case, do not like you, because you don't really get along. All right, let's get let's get Kuken married. Now, the easiest way to get someone married is to hit this button over here, Arrange Marriage. If we click this, it'll bring up a list of everyone who Ken over here is eligible to marry. Now, some of these people will be too young. For example, Cornelia over here is only seven years old. Obviously, they can't get married now. However, what we could do is set up a betrothal so that when Cornelia comes of age and all characters in Crusader Kings come of age at 16, at which point they can get married. So in Crusader Kings, 16 year old is when you become an adult. Now, historically, some places were like 13 or 14. In some places, these arranged marriages actually happened. People got married to each other when they were like six years old each. And then, you know, just to solidify some alliance or something like that. But CK2 just sort of decides generally speaking we're going to put the childhood versus adulthood divide at 16. so we could get betrothed now but we wouldn't be able to get married for a few years now sometimes that might still be something you want to do because maybe it's someone with really good traits so different reasons you might want to get married to someone maybe you need their skill to boost your skills right it's like oh we're planning to do sneaky sneaky stuff we want to marry someone with the highest possible intrigue because her, my wife's intrigue score will be added to mine so i can do more stabby stabby things Marrying for skill, that's one reason you might marry. Another reason you might marry is to solidify various packs. So for example, if I married Garcenda over here, this would lead to a non-aggression pack with Duke Raymond Pons of Aquitaine. And these non-aggression packs can sometimes be um, upgraded to full on alliances. That's the second reason you might marry someone. The third reason you might marry someone is because they might have claims on titles. Uh, Garcenda over here has a claim on Toulouse. Um, and I might be able to press that claim on her behalf, or some of these claims can be inherited by their children, depending on a whole variety of things. So you might marry someone because they might set you up with a child that could inherit France or something like that. The fourth reason you might marry someone is because they have good genetics. Now in this list of traits that people have, some of the traits, hopefully we can find one, will have a heart shape. I might just do a search in a second here. Uh, ooh, we actually didn't find any of those. Okay, what I'm gonna do, since I don't see any in this list, 
I'm going to use the character finder over here, bottom right corner. I'll talk more about this later, but I just want to find someone with a trait so I can give you an example. There you go. Genius. So you can do a search here. See how there's this heart-shaped trait? This is a genetic trait. So something over here, the Queen of Mumu. Wait, she's my wife? My wife is a genius? Oh, that's amazing. So traits that have hearts can be inherited by children. It's a random chance. It's not guaranteed, but... The children I have with some Thane over here, my wife, have a higher than average chance of becoming geniuses. Um, other things are strong. There you go. Someone flexing in a heart over here. Um, attractive. Oh, there's none of them, but attractive. I guess I could go search all. Attractive. There you go. Diplomacy, traction options. Um, there's, is it quick? There you go. Quick, sort of a lesser version of genius, but it's pretty good. But there's also poor traits. For example, um, uh, hair lip. Hair lip is a, it's in a heart, which means it's a genetic trait, but it doesn't have a green background. It has a purple background because it's a bad genetic trait. So the fourth and final reason you might choose to marry someone is because they have a genetic trait you like. Notice that love has nothing to do with it. No one married for love. That's crazy talk. Uh, you just marry for practical reasons. So with our heir over here, we have to choose to marry. So again, you can arrange marriage through this icon here, which will quickly and easily find you a list of eligible people. You can also potentially go and use the find characters interface over here to find someone you can marry. So again, this little button over here is super useful, find characters. So let's say we did want to marry a genius. Uh, well, we have to make sure she's, uh, she got to be Catholic. I mean, my parents would never approve, right? It's something, something, one true religion, where the one true religion is whatever your character happens to follow in this particular situation. Um, we'll obviously want a lady type person who is not currently married. And we've struck out. There are no eligible geniuses around. But you can you can sort of shop like this, and this will potentially let you find people that might not be in this list because maybe you have to pay some bribes to, you know, the, the, the sort of king because they kind of have final say for some of these things. Anyway, um, Princess of Germany. Hedwig has claims to all of Germany. Well, maybe we should just marry her. No genetic traits. Not too impressive skill-wise. She has no double-digit skills. But... I'm just, if I uh, if I click on her over here, so she's got a weak claim on the kingdom of Germany. Uh, on succession, weak claims can be are given to children who are not second or third in line. So her first child will theoretically inherit this weak claim on the kingdom of Germany. All right, I'll marry her. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click over here, and it's going to open up this little window of hey. So me, I'm Fred. I'm talking to Count. Thankmar, and I was saying, hey, let's arrange a marriage between my son, Kuken, and I don't know if it's your daughter or not, but this this Princess Hedwig, let's arrange this marriage. There's this matrilineal button um, over here. Now, normally in a marriage, the children of a marriage are of the dynasty of the father, right? They get the father's last name. With a matrilineal marriage, they will instead be of the dynasty of the mother. They will get the mother's last name. Um, so when you're marrying your sons to someone, generally speaking, you don't want that on. When you're marrying your daughters to someone, you may or may not want to do matrilineal. Um, it is a lot harder to convince people to do a matrilineal marriage, but maybe it's really important that the children of your daughter are part of your dynasty because, you know, maybe, maybe your daughter is going to be your heir because of, of various succession laws could be. So you may want to keep an eye on that. Anyway, we're going to say that I'm going to unpause. I boost the speed up to about a three. I'm just gonna wait for that to resolve itself because it takes a while for the messengers to get back and forth. You gotta go all the way to Germany. There you go. To the level-headed king. Ooh, I'm level-headed. Uh, you get all kinds of different commentary about yourself here. To the level-headed king, Fred. Blessings upon you and your house. I accept your suggestions that Kuken and Princess Hedwig get married. So I'm gonna say okay here. I'm gonna keep it paused. You see that Hedwig Ludofinger has arrived in my court. She's come all the way over here to the kingdom, the petty kingdom of Mumu to be with her husband, who is my son and heir. All right, and it'll be interesting to see if they pop out some kids, maybe suddenly we'll find ourselves the king of Mumu and Germany. That's the thing, you don't, to, to, to paint the world, to conquer the world, you don't necessarily have to actually conquer it with military, you can conquer it with love. 
And by love, I mean having exactly the right kind of sex to make exactly the right kind of heirs to inherit things. And maybe also assassinating people who are ahead of you in the line of succession, because that can be really handy. <clears throat> anyway, so there we go. We've taken care of one of these little pop-ups. Let's take care of these others, and then we'll put a cut in this video at this point. The game is asking us to pick an ambition. So our character wants needs an ambition or it doesn't need one but it's better to have an ambition running because there's good things that can happen with ambition so on your character sheet over here in the top right corner there's a button to choose an ambition so all characters in the game will tend to pick ambitions on their own let's check ken so ken no he's not running anything right now i think they can actually don't know how that works um in in vanilla here and for the npcs but anyway for ourselves we can pick an ambition we click this we'll get a pop-up menu of choosing what our ambition is. We can choose to be a paragon of virtue. So we'll try to, we want our, par, uh, our piety to be 2,000 or higher. We look at the piety over here, we got a piety of 16. So we would desire to have a piety of over 2,000. And if we do, we get plus one to our learning skill, we gain even more piety, we've been known as the holy. Um, and you know, good things would happen for the, ca the Catholics and the Pope would like us and all that kind of stuff. We could also choose to be exalted among men which would be, in this case, to have a prestige of 5,000 or greater. If we successfully do this, we would get diplomacy, gain some more prestige, and a bunch of people would like us because it would be very impressive. We can also choose to improve our learning because our learning is so low. We only have a learning of one. I mean, we can barely string two words together and we can't read probably. Um, we can choose to try to improve this. So what this will do, What's gonna happen with this is it's gonna start doing events. Our character is actively trying to get smarter. So it'll probably give us events of like, hey, uh, you'll have someone try to help you learn your letters or something like that. Um, and this will run basically until we hit a learning of eight or higher, at which point it will stop, we'll gain some prestige, and then we'll pick a new ambition. Finally, we got one to become the King of Ireland, um, which depending on things can give you um, different subjugation, Casus Belli. So Casus Belli are it's cause for war, basically, is what that means. To start a war with someone, you need a reason. If I go, let's go, I I, I wanna, you know, I wanna start a war over here. So we got lakes over here, uh, being run by Chief Donchad of Osrage. He's not bending to need to anyone. He actually oh, that's pretty impressive, actually. He's just got the double chiefdom. He doesn't bend the knee to anyone. I, I right click, by the way, you can right click on any character and get this diplomacy screen. This is how you interact with people. You right click on their face and you pick something. Declare war is grayed out because I don't have a cause for war. I need a justification for this war to convince my people to go and fight. So um, depending on who you are, if you have the become king of whatever, this can give you reasons to fight. Um, I'm gonna go, let's say we wanna improve learning. I don't, well, you know what? We don't have a lot of time to improve learning. I'm very unlikely to become king of Ireland either, but let's go ahead and enable that. So we want to become king of Ireland. If we're pagan, which we're not because we are Catholic, um, with certain succession laws, we could do unlimited CB, but we can't do that. Um, if the fabricate, so we'll talk about council missions and blah, 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 blah. We're going to use costs for canceling the kingdom. This ambition cannot be canceled. That's okay. We'll just hit okay. So a king, a Fred here, would actually like to be a proper king of all of Ireland. I don't think that's going to happen in his lifetime, but that's what he desires. So that's what we're going to go ahead and enable. Um... We are unlikely to have more children as well. Um, fertility is based, I believe, primarily... Well, there's lots of stats that can influence fertility. Uh, for example, Chase gives us a penalty for fertility. One of the biggest things, though, is the age of the lady. Um, fertility, I don't remember the numbers. Fertility starts to drop at a certain age, and I believe at 45 is a hard cap. I think that um, women cannot have babies in CK2 after the age of 45. So, um, unfortunately, if we don't have a genius now, and I don't think we do, I don't think we're going to be getting a genius at all. Which is a darn shame, but hey, at least genius gives plus 5 to all stats, which is why it's so desirable. Um, at least our wife has insanely good stats, which means that our state stats are better. Um, so yeah, we have a personal learning one, but at least our state learning is 19. So, we have special minor titles granted, grantable. Let's click on this and see what's going on. We've got the screen here. These are minor titles that we can give out. First of all, our army commanders are a thing that can be assigned. Usually you're not gonna wanna bother with this manually. So go ahead and check, click on this auto assign commanders and the game will take care of you. That's gonna be okay. But you can see there's a bunch of minor titles. Now the game is it's saying here, we haven't designated a regent. If we were for some reason become incapable, right? If we took a knock to the head and we're basically in a coma, who's gonna manage our realm while we are unable to do anything else. Um, if we don't pick someone and that happens, the game will sort of auto pick someone. So we might wanna choose someone 
um, ahead of time just to make sure that we're pleased with things. Um, here, we might say our son. Maybe it'll be good training for him, for him to look after things. Is that a good pick? I don't know. Things could go horribly, horribly wrong, depending on the traits that people have. If they're greedy they might, and, and they become your regent, they might start stealing money from your treasury. All kinds of stuff can happen. Um, there's also these other titles you can give out. Master the Horse, Master the Hunt. These don't really do anything of their own, but they make people like you better. Master the Horse, this is the person that is in charge of your stables. It's a very prestigious post. Assigning this to someone will make them like you more. You can see that opinion plus five. It also gives them a monthly salary and gives them prestige because it's a very prestigious thing. So we can click and we can choose anyone in our court to give it to. We might want to give it to one of our vassals. So we've got the three chiefs here and that bishop. If we, we might want to keep them as happy as possible because your vassals being cranky is not a healthy way of life. But you could choose to do something else as well. For example, it might not be a bad idea to give one of these titles to my son because that way my son will start to accrue money and prestige. And when I die and start playing as my son, I'll have a bit of a kickstart. Hey, that sounds good. Let's make a Kuken our master of the horse. But the master of the hunt, I'm gonna go um, Brandub over here. He only likes me 19. Let's go ahead and make him master of the hunt. High Almoner is another prestigious location or uh, um, uh, post. We're gonna give it to Senatig, this chief here who only likes me 19, so we'll boost him a little bit more. There's the cupbearer over here. You're entrusting people with their, your drinks. Um, higher salary, higher prestige. I don't know, but it feels like it, it might give them a bonus to trying to assassinate me. So I like to give the cupbearer title to someone who really likes me already. So the bishop over here, he already likes me 77. He's content. Content people are much less likely to scheme against you. That sounds great. I'm going to make him my cupbearer. I trust him with my life, literally. Um, so we have this. Now, we also have idle council members as a warning, and that's going to be the same tab over here. So let's close this for a second. There's a variety of buttons here. We've got a button for council, which is the same window as the minor titles. And this is our council. Now we're gonna put a cut in here because this video's gotten kind of long, but we're gonna talk about our council here and we're gonna talk about assigning them in places. Um, and that'll take care of the last pop-up. And at that point, we'll feel pretty comfortable to sort of just unpause and let some time go by. Thanks for watching, folks. Hopefully you find these useful. If you do have questions, please leave them in the comments. I will try to look into them and answer them and other viewers might answer them as well. If you do know how to play the game, um, Keep an eye out in the comments and, uh, you know, help answer questions for people. Thanks for watching, folks. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.